Welcome to LOA Today. I'm Walt Kaysen. With me today is life coach and LOA teacher, Joel Elston. This is your daily dose of happy. We are so happy you decided to join us today. Now, if you're among the uh, 1% or so who watch us uh, on video as we record these things, rather than the 99% who only hear the audio, uh, you may be a little bit confused today. Um, you may wonder, you know, did, did you screw up? Are you to blame for, you know, catching us on the wrong day or whatever? Um, and actually, you haven't because we kind of shifted the schedule around a bit. So uh, instead of Joel and I recording on Tuesday nights, we're going to record on Monday nights, which means I'm actually doing two shows on Mondays. I just finished one three hours ago with Anne Marie and special guest June Edward, who was on with us earlier today. And now we're doing the one with Joel. So um, no, no blame involved. No, no shame. If you missed uh, the, the show being recorded, it's just that we decided to kind of switch things around, mainly so I could have more time on Tuesdays to do some other stuff. Um, so that's what's going on there. But, uh, Joel, we're going to keep on doing what we normally do anyway. We're just doing it on a different day, right? I mean, Absolutely. that's what the changes. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So, so, cause that's what we do. <laughs> that's what we do. Absolutely. That's what we do. <laughs> and, uh, once again, I got a topic off of your page. Um, you posted something about blame, which, uh, that, that's actually been a concept that's been on my mind off and on for the past few months. Um, both here on the show and in my, you know, personal and private life. In that, uh, it, it really has become very, very evident to me just how useless that emotion is. It really doesn't do much of anything good for us. It, the only thing I can find, I, I, I try to find, you know, what can I appreciate, appreciate about everything, including the most, you know, dire, volatile, horrible, terrible stuff that goes on in life. And the one thing I can think of that's useful where blame is concerned is that it's a great way to point out to us that's not where we want to go. That's about the best one I yeah. come up with. Um, have you come up with a better one? I don't know. Well, I, I think blame, you know, the initial phase of blame or like what I call origin discovery, if something happens, somebody wrongs you, uh, it is helpful to understand, you know, what that did to you. Like, uh, you know, the, the concept of, hey, this person when I was younger, you know, my, my mom – you know, was, was very anxious and she spoke, exposed me to a bunch of anxiety. She worried about everything. So when I was dealing with, when I had a, a an anxiety brain, so blame, or, or in this case, I, again, origin discovery uh, is a process where I can say, okay, that's where, that's where that came from. Uh, mm. My mom didn't mean to harm me. She didn't mean to. She was, in a, you know, she grew up in a, a, an incredibly toxic situation herself, and she dealt with un, in her entire life. She dealt with unbelievable anxiety. So I, I, I don't hold her in blame. But the original blame, or the the origins of this, started uh, at least in my life with her, and in her life, it started with her mother. If we look at all that, uh, the problem that I have with blame is. Blame puts you in a victim mindset. If you, I have worked with clients for years that, that, you know, my parents did this wrong and my family did this wrong and all, and it isn't that they're wrong and they're blamed it, but at what point are we going to accept responsibility for the condition today? And, right. um, unfortunately, my opinion of traditional therapy, uh, traditional psychology and how therapists handle this somehow, uh, you know, blame and trauma and being sort of stuck in that kind of mindset is sort of, it, it, it's almost like, well, nothing is your fault because this happened. And mm -hmm. if nothing's your fault because this happened, then you're, you, you really can't help it because it's somebody else's fault. So blame in a sense almost renders you to believe, well, there's nothing I can do about it. It's not my job to fix it. But the problem is there's nobody else that's going to fix this. And mm. you, you see these cycles of uh, societal blame and, and, you know, cultural bl blaming. And, you know, I have a, uh, th there's just a lot going on. I'm not about, as you know, I am not about uh, anybody harming anybody or any of those things, but there's the radical responsibility of, you know, self-responsibility, radical acceptance. Uh, you get to a place where blame serves, a, 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 it helps in identifying. This is what happened. But from that point on, it becomes your responsibility to fix you, regardless of the origins of where this came from. And I, I you know, that's a hard message for people. Like you're, you're, 
I'll hear often, well, Joel, you're blaming the victim. And I'm not blaming mm-hmm. the victim at all. I'm helping the person who was victimized get out of the victim mindset by accepting this horrible stuff happened. And it is now up to us, you and me, to work together and figure out a way where this doesn't take over your life or you're, or you're allowing this to go forever and ever. And there was a, one of my uh, cases years ago, and this is before I was in life coaching and I was a, a manager of residential group homes and mm-hmm. uh, for emotionally handicapped kids. And it was, you know, it, it was not a fun place. It, I enjoyed right. it, but it was not, to be honest with you, what we were doing wasn't, in my mind, very therapeutic. It was more of like herding sheep and trying to, you know, get everybody there in and, and, and one place. And so there's one young man in particular, and he, he had been uh, uh, horribly, abused for years by a priest, a Catholic mm. priest. Uh, oh. I want to make sure I say that. And uh, he he was, you know, and, and, and really just obscene stuff happened to him when he was a child. And so he was, once that was discovered, he was taken from their care and he ended up in our home. Um, and so he would go to therapy every week and he would go see his therapist and the therapist would remind him of all this and uh, it, 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 there was this, this incredibly, uh, toxic, it, it appeared toxic to me. I was, I was just managing the home. So I wasn't involved in therapeutic, in the direct therapeutic, uh, treatment of my clients, but I was making sure they were receiving good therapeutic care by professional. And every week this kid would come home and he would flip over the table, like just those <laughs> chairs, uh, break right. glasses and, um, uh, he normally would do that when the rest of the kids were there and the other staff was there. Well, one, one afternoon, one Wednesday afternoon, he came in and I was the only one there. And so he walks in screaming profanity, flipped the table over. And I went out and I said, Hey buddy, I'm the only one here. I, I, I don't know who this is for, but I, it's just me, you know? And mm. he goes, every time I talk to this therapist, they tell me about, and I have to talk about what happened to me and, and, and I said, that's, I said, I don't, I agree. I don't see where that's very valuable. Uh, and he goes, and you, you don't know what it's like. And he goes, I, I really don't. And, and I said, and it's something that I regretted saying at first. And it was my instinct talking, not an education, not a sort of an educative stance, but it was my instinct talking. And I said, Hey, let's, let's say his name was John. Yeah. Um, I said, John, I said, I'm going to say something that might be wrong and I'm not a therapist and I apologize if it's wrong. He said, but from my perspective, the the animal that molested you, it, it's horrible. He's in jail. He's gone. He he he's in jail for thirty years. He'll he'll never see the light of day, and it's it will never be right. But the only person molesting you right now is you in your brain, and that sounds harsh. But you're reliving this over and over. And I don't agree with your therapist running this through every single week with no resolution. And of course, he's, he told me to F off and he went to his room and I said, and I was like, okay, I probably really screwed that up. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And, uh, uh, I, I actually sort of told our clinical director what I'd done. She goes, that's probably not the best thing to say, but you know, you didn't do any more damage. It's already done to this kid. So let's just, so. Anyway, life happened. My events happened. You know, this kid moved on to another home. I lose track of the kid. I have a lot of stuff go wrong in my life. So many years later, I get a email from this, from it. I didn't recognize, but it was from a university, a Texas university. Um, and I'm like, I don't know anybody there, but I recognize the name. And let's say it's again, John so and so at U- university of Texas dot edu. And, um, I'm like, oh my God, who is this the guy? I mean, because this is years later. And so he sent me an email and said, do you remember me? And he told me his name. And I go, I do. And he said, can I call you? And, you know, at the time, I'm easy to find on the internet, so it wasn't hard to find me. And um, and I go, yeah. And I'm thinking, oh boy, this kid's about to just tell, grown man now is about to go off on me. And mm. um, so he called me and, and I said, how are you doing? He says, well, he said, I'm going to University of Texas. He said, I'll get to that in a minute. And he said, I just wanted to, I said, if, I said, I probably know what you want to talk about. And I, I was like preparing, you know, I said, look, I, yeah. I, 
you know, I, I really am sorry if I said anything that was upsetting to you back then. And he goes, no, in fact, he said, do you remember what you said to me? I go, I've never forgotten what I said. And I always didn't know if I was right or wrong. He goes, well, I didn't like it. Over the years, over, with, over time, I realized there's nobody that ever had the courage to tell me what I was. I, you're right. I had to let go of this. I have to get to the point of, you know, solution mode. I had to get to a point of action mode. I'm stuck in this victim mode and I'm going to spend the rest of my life being medicated to get away from these horrible memories that this, this animal did to me, or I can figure out an action. And he said, that's why I'm at the University of Texas. I'm studying to get my medical degree and I want to be a psychiatrist to work with kids that were sexually abused. And wow. he said, I have, uh, an inside information on that that I think could bring help to those that's, that have been suffering with that. So he said, yeah. that was one of the strongest things. I've, he said, I've been to therapy for years and years and years, and nobody ever told me that. And it does sound harsh when you say it, but it was so true. And you said it so kindly and you did. He said, it, it's a message that I will incorporate going forward at some point. Everybody has to deal with what happened to them. And I, I thought that was so profound that this young man who, who the, the action to make something, it, it is a never a good thing that anybody goes through what this kid went through. But sure. he did. And so his response to it is, let me use that fuel to let me help other kids that one day will, will maybe have the right therapy that will help them speed up their process as well. Uh, that's been many years ago. He's a medical doctor doing exactly what he says. He has a, t- a practice in California. We stay in touch frequently, and uh, he's currently writing a book. And wow. uh, when he do, we're going to have him on the show and Fabulous. promote his book. But uh, yeah. So, but th- this is such a sound uh, concept that a lot of people are going to be like, "Oh, that that sounds pretty harsh," but. It's, we do that to ourselves. We, I, I know, I know, I work with people who are 25 years old, you know, 20, 22, 23, 24, that their whole message every week is, but my mom and dad you know, they sent me to boarding school when I was 12. They did all these things wrong. And that's what, and, and I, my message is to keep shifting them from, you're not wrong, but the relevance of that is, is that if you're stuck there, we're never going to be able to move on. So blame keeps you stuck in the historical event. It keeps you from taking action and, and, and accepting responsibility to take the actions needed to change. And that's a long answer to your question, but that's what I think about blame. Yeah, well, I, and I agree with you. I think that it does a really nice job of underlining what I was saying, which is that I have trouble understanding what the value of blame is because I, I always want to find the value in everything. And that one's a tough one for me. Like I said, the best one I've come up with is, well, it's a great indicator of where I don't want to be. Uh, but boy, that's a tough one. Cause like you say, when you're, when you're in that blame state, you're stuck and you're, you're, you're not going anywhere. The, the, the one thought that did come to my mind, maybe this is something you tell me whether or not you think this is something. The one thought that did come to my mind is that different people seem to need to repeat. I'll call them traumas for the lack of a better term. Um, it, it can be something as severe as what this guy went through, but it could also be a much more mild trauma. It could be any, any kind of, of negative situation. People seem to have different levels or not levels, dif- different quantities of bad stuff they have to go through before they're finally willing to shift off of it. And maybe I'm not right about that, but it just seems like it just, it, some people, it seems like they, they can get it the first time. Some people can get it after, you know, two or three times. Some people take 20 times and it, it's very, it's very confusing. And, and there's a part of me that rebels against it. It's just, you know, rev- is revulsed by the whole idea of somebody wanting to, you know, continuously subject themselves to being in that horribly stuck state. And yet that seems to be what happens. Well, a lot of times it's reinforced, uh, by the events or, or the, you know, I know families of blame where, you know, when, in, in, in my household growing up, I never ever heard one time, and this is, you know, it's not a bad thing. Nobody in my household growing up ever said, ever said was, you know, I was wrong about that. Mm. We would, we would argue 
when I was wrong, I would argue. If I, if, if, I, I, I just defend the position, even when I knew I was wrong, just because nobody in our house says you're wrong. So there is, there is cultural, there's stuff that takes place in families where the blame is always, well, you, yes, I might have done this, but this worse event caused me to, is not as, you know, that, or that comparison of blame. And whatever, whatever happens, there are some people that, People hopefully get to a place when they realize the cycle of blaming, no matter how many times you have to just reboot that, you hopefully get to the place of, you know, I, I, I'm never going to get satisfaction. Even if the person admitted to me that they were totally wrong, how are we going to fix that today? Right. What do we do with that? And my very, one of my very first clients, uh, when I went in private practice, I've shared this several times. Um, it was a, a female who, uh, probably about at the time, 50 years old, and she was going to see a psychiatrist every week and for, for 15, 12 or 15 years, I forget, but I think it was 12 years actually, uh, 12 years every single week. And they were trying to figure out, did her father molest her or not? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, re I remember this story. And so she came to me and I said, well, I, I don't know what you want me to do with that. She well, actually, Dr. Master, uh, who was my mentor, uh, I contacted him and he said, you know, that's something that I would be able to help you with. And I'm trying to figure out what am I going to be able to help with, with here? And he, and he said, you're going to need a plan. Uh, and Joel can help you get a plan of how to move forward with this. And so I was like, okay, well, I'm sorry that this may have happened to you, uh, but it seems to me for 12 years, the question is the question of it, the, the searching for blame, yes or no, is creating the problem. Not it's really no longer the event. And she's like, well, maybe. And I said, so again, going to sound harsh. Why don't we just pick a side and we go forward? It almost doesn't matter which side, but we're going to have to get to resolution stage. And if we're stuck in constant search of blame and assigning of blame, you're, you're delaying your life for 15 years. You, you have been stuck in this process. It's not serving you. It's not healthy. You're, and, and again, it sounds harsh and she didn't like it. She bristled when I said pick a side. Uh, but when we sort of did, it, it's when we were able to move on. If we we're able to move past and then we can deal with it as if it did happen if that, and that's sort of the side we went with. So, your, your father's dead. Your mother's dead. Any collaborating evidence is, is totally gone. So if we're going to accept that this happened when you were eight, as you seem to remember, then what do we do with that now instead of the weekly back and forth of did he or didn't he? Because he was such a nice man. He, you know, he, he didn't do it later. He didn't do all these other things. I said, see, that debate, that intrusive thought that you have going on about this constant debate of blame is, is keeping you stuck. So again, the, the, the blame is a sticking mechanism. It is what, it, and it, it is reinforced, as I was saying during my original monologue, you know, in the beginning, <laughs> uh, the, it's reinforced with traditional therapists today of, well, it, it, none of this is your fault. And it's, it's certainly not your fault that it happened. <laughs> but you're, when you say it's not your fault, you're automatically saying, but there, you have no remedy, uh, other than, just blame and blame is not a remedy. Blame is, is, should be a call to action. It should be, it should be the origin base. How, this is what happened. I can place blame on the originating thing here. I want to now move on. And that's what I always try to do with my clients. And that's not where that again, it's just 2023 and people, it, it, it goes a different way now. Yeah, I hear you. And uh, let me throw something else in there and, and see what you think of it. When, when you talked about how, uh, the, the, the therapists are, are trying to help people to understand it's not their fault. When I hear that phrase, I bristle at that phrase and I bristle at it because the implication behind it is the first thing we have to do is find who's at fault. Yes. Yeah. And the reason I bristle at it is I ask why. I mean, I understand the, the emotional need. I, I understand, sure. I, I've certainly experienced that emotional need to want to blame somebody. Um, but from a therapeutic viewpoint, the question I ask is, why is that so important? 
The only well, answer that I, I can think of that has um, in conversations I've had with therapists and coaches and so forth over, over the years here on the program is if you can identify an emotion that has been haunting you for some time and you can allow yourself to feel it all the way through until it dissipates, you can release it. So from that perspective, I can, un- I can understand, I can appreciate yeah. that. But yeah. when I, when I hear somebody say, well, you know, you're not at fault. There, there's an implication along with it that says somebody else is. Right. And that's the part yeah. I don't understand. Why is it so important to say that somebody else is from a therapeutic viewpoint? I can understand from the emotional viewpoint of I want to blame somebody. I get that. But from the therapeutic viewpoint, that's the part I don't get. Why would the therapist even want to bring that up in the first place? Well, it, it, it's it's one of those. I, I I have first of all, I don't have an answer to your question, but it's, I didn't think it's you did. Pretty, I, I'm, yeah, I'm posing it's, a ridiculously yeah, crazy yeah. question in that sense. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's it's like you know when you know my son Justin and I had a discussion I don't know a year or two ago about a motorcycle, hmm. and I told him I will not buy him a motorcycle, and he said why? I said because I have known multiple people that have been killed on a motorcycle. And I cannot have you at higher risk. I lost a child in a car accident. I just, I'm, I can't stop you when you get your own job from buying a motorcycle, but I am not going to buy it when you want. And he goes, well, dad, it's very seldom the, the, the motorcycle driver's fault. And I said, but that doesn't reduce, that doesn't help with dying. You know, the, the, the result that it's not that, it, oh, you're not to blame, but you're still dead. So it's mm. that my concept is it's much more dangerous regardless of whose fault it is. We, mm-hmm. we, we, oh, when something happens, uh, an event, uh, somebody bombs a building, uh, some of the first, one of the first things we do, we, we must find out all origins. We, we launch multiple committees, uh, we, before the smoke clears, we're, 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 yeah, of course we need to know who it is and decide what we're going to do politically. But we are, a, we have developed into, we must know who did this, whose fault is this, so we can do the stuff we do attached to that. And from a therapeutic standpoint, you, you can get, it, it doesn't offer a lot of value. If you're talking about the, the idea as I did with my two cases, it's certainly good to understand. I, my, my, and this is a really important point. I've worked with a lot of sexual abuse victims and there is never a moment that I blame my clients for these horrid acts. You know that sure. there, there's never a moment. It, it, it is not their fault. The act happened. They did zero to it. There is zero. I, I don't, it, it's knowing that. However, as I keep saying at some point in the process, when we're healed enough from the traumatic event of this evil, then we're healed enough to then take action to fix you. Not because of it's somebody else who's regardless of fault, we have to repair ourselves. We have to be able to move on. We That's the sort of that growth mindset model. What happens is ours to repair regardless of the origins of the, of what caused it to break. It's really yeah. important. I like that. I like the way you describe that. It's bringing to mind a conversation I had with guests from um, what, what, from the perspective of this show is yesterday's show or the last show. I actually did it three hours ago, but, uh, uh-huh. with that guest after we were done, we, as so often happens with these things, we, uh, we did a little conversation after the show, uh, me, her and Emery. And in the course of that conversation, we kind of got into the conversation about, um, good and evil, particularly from a vibrational perspective and identified that, uh, I mean, she made it very clear good and evil both exist in the world. And when I kind of, pinned her down on what exactly that meant. She clarified that um, by evil, she meant um, those who are living in an extremely low vibrational place. You know, in other words, evil is, is, this is my wording. Evil is a label that we apply to describe really, really low vibrational living. And the reason I, I, I mentioned that is for me, that's a way of differentiating between that discernment that, that identifying you were talking about earlier, identifying, you know, what, what happened and, and, uh, on the other hand, blaming for it. To me, there, there's a difference. Mm-hmm. So when I think about this whole question of good and evil and evil existing in the world and, and, uh, how do we deal with it? How do we handle it? I think of it from the point of view of it's a low vibrational state. So why do we choose to live a low vibrational state? Well, 
we come into this world of contrast. We come to, into this, what they call a duality or, or, or a, a contrast or polarity, you know, good and evil, white, white and black, right and wrong, dark and light, you know, all, all the different ways we can express that kind of thing, which means we're here to experience all of it. And I, I have to admit, this still is hard for me to get my brain around. Why on earth would I want to come into this world to experience trauma? And I can't think of a good answer for that. Um, and there are different opinions about that. But what I do know is this. We do experience it. Regardless of whether we chose to or not, we do experience it. It's there. So it almost doesn't matter what the epistemology of it is. What matters is what are we going to do with it? And that's really I what agree. you're trying. What are we yeah. going to do with it? Well, I have experienced a bit of trauma along the way. And, yeah, I'd say. Yeah. And while certainly not something I would ever want to do again, I also, I, I can appreciate, you know, the growth I had from trauma, the resilience that I've gained, the, the strength that I've had from, you know, various traumas. And while I, I can't imagine in my, based on my human brain that I'm using today, uh, that I could imagine choosing this life that these events would have happened. However, if I'm thinking from a more metaphysical standpoint, if this is one of 18 million lives that I've lived and I've chosen a bunch of different ones, I want to want to try it all. I want to try everything. And that would just be one of the flavors on the menu, so to speak. We, we so, said something about uh, this. If, if you look, I think we, I think we, you're right. I think we all tend to do that. It's, it, we have enough of these well, lifetimes that we live. We're going to, we're going to try it all. We're going to, we want all flavors. Well, yeah. Again, I, I use this. We talked about this talk before. I've used this, uh, concept. When you, when you go to the, you know, the, the big amusement parks, you don't ride the merry-go-round for excitement. You go on the big, the big boy. <laughs> well, it depends you on know? your ages, but I get your point. <laughs> well, I don't know what age you're, but, but my age, we go on the big boys, you know? Well, I'm thinking so, like uh, two, two or three year olds. <laughs> well, I mean, we can, you know, I, I get that. Um, but like the Hulk roller coaster in, um, have you ever ridden that at Universal Studios? I, I have not. No, I'm actually not much of a roller coaster fan. Okay. So this is an amazing roller coaster that you go up. And as you're going up, the first time you ride it, you're unaware of this. And usually the roller coasters hit, you know, hit the peak and then they gain speed when they go down. Well, right. about halfway up, this rockets up to 60 miles an hour on oh, the way geez. up. Wow. So you're thrown back, then it goes over the hill and you go through a series of incredibly tight loops and, you know, and, and you're just like, you know, and it's amazing. And, but while it's going on, it's just like, oh my gosh. So I want to ride that the first time I get to Universal Studios. That's the first ride I want to ride. Uh, <laughs> it's also the one with the biggest line because it's the most exciting ride. So when we break down, and this, this is when we break down all this stuff in, we're only using our human brains and, and consciousness that we're the limited consciousness that we have to really understand all this from, so we, we can't have these metaphysical answers with these limited access brains. Does that make sense? Mm. Oh yeah. Yeah. I've, I've run into that I barrier mean, many times. There, there are a lot yeah, of things I just yeah. can't seem to understand because I just don't have enough yeah. processing power. Right. But, but once, once, you know, again, my belief system is once you're sort of rejoined, you transition and you rejoin with source energy, you have access to everything. And yeah. again, I know my personality, at least in this lifetime, and I can't imagine, yeah, I can just see me just jumping right back in. Let's go do the next crazy thing. Go I mean, I can see that happening. It, it, it you know, I, I, I'm the guy that just keeps jumping back in, you know, and it, because I, I just, I, despite everything that has happened, and I think you get this, I really love to live. I mean, I'm not just kidding. I love living. I, I, mm. I, I savor living. I, I have, uh, I love my life and, the good, the bad, and the ugly all were necessary, and I love all of it, but because it got me here. So uh, I think the you know that that question when we if we're ever transitioned to the other side, we'll, we'll have that conversation one day. Walt, we have bigger brains. No, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> of course, by that time, maybe we've already transitioned, so we'll have uh, unlimited access unlimited. to brain power. Yeah, you know? yeah. yeah. So, we, won't, we won't even need to ask the question. Yeah, point. it'll be just obvious. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm with you on that one. Um, I, I'm also, I, I find that it's a challenging topic from the point of view of, um, like I said, it's it's so easy to feel 
the desire for blame. It's so easy to feel the desire for I, I was wronged and I, I want, it, it's almost like we want somebody to recognize we were wronged and, and you know, say you, you, you're, you're completely right to have felt, felt wronged. Yeah. Um, and when you say it that way, it sounds so weird, but really that's, that's the way it feels. Well, we, I think we all want to be reinforced. You know, if I have, uh, I have uh, probably been two years ago, this, this lady I was dating and we, you know, we, we had the event where we broke up and mm. shockingly, she thought I went to the gym too much was the starting <laughs> conversation. Uh, I can't I imagine where, where she, that one came from. I don't know yeah. where that came from. But, no. and, and so anyway, it, it just was, it, 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 and it was, I wasn't, I wasn't, I thought it was a pretty casual relationship. She was getting, you know, so a whole lot to it. So anyway, we had a conversation and we agreed to, it was very calm. There was no yelling. I was, I value that period of time. I wasn't willing mm-hmm. to go further, make a deeper commitment. And she was looking for that. So we parted way. Sure. So. Okay. Then found, she started going, we had a lot of mutual friends. So she started going to her friends saying, telling the story from her side and then seeking reinforcement from her friends that you are, am I right? Mm -hmm. You know, and then if, you know, and likely was probably they, what are they going to say? Yeah, you're right. And so that actually got me into a place when one of her, one of our joint friends tried to talk to me about it. Then I then told my side of the story, looking to sort of rally the troops to my side. right? Right. And, that was such an exercise in futility, but it felt really needed, if that yeah. makes any sense. It does, it felt exactly. Like, yeah. I, I really, yeah, yeah. And, and of course, my logical brain is going, none of this matters. But, but yet, the need to do that, and I finally got to the point where I, I, it felt like middle school. And I finally just said, I have huge respect and care deeply for her. Our situations didn't match, and we moved on. That just became my standard answer. And no mm. matter what, well, she said this, and I was like, well, I, she's t- entitled to her opinion. I'm entitled to mine, and I just want to move move forward. So, But it, it's, it's amazing how it just felt so necessary to defend my position and sort of readjust the, the blame, so to speak, on her when we just really weren't matching on what we wanted. This is two human beings that did, had a different vision of what going forward looked like. Exactly. Yeah, that nails it right there. Um, in fact, you're, you're reminding me of something. Um, there was a book that came out about, uh, I'm going to say 10 years ago by the former NBA basketball player, Charles Barkley. Mm. And uh, I, I love the name of the book because it, it hits spot on with what we're talking about here. The name of the book was, I may be wrong, but I doubt it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love it. I, I mean, does that summarize it or what? That summarizes that feeling. I, I, I may be wrong, but I don't think so. <laughs> Well, when we, when, when friends break up, I'm on the other side, and because I do what I do for a living, you know, people want to talk to me. And I'm, you know, and, I, and especially when it's two friends that I know that break up, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be diplomatic. I'm trying to be supportive and trying to, you know, well, this happened and this happened and, you know, and, and this, he always did this or she always did this. And, you know, I'm like, well, I'm sorry to hear that. But say, and, and I'm trying to get more to, you're broken up. Let's, let's not damage things any further by, by really trying to blow this up and make it worse. But yet there's a need mm-hmm. to, well, you don't know half the things she did. And I go, I don't, mm-hmm. I wasn't there, but to be honest with you, it's not really none of my business. And mm-hmm. you know, it, it but it, th- this need to throw the other person under the bus, it's like, now you were married to him for seven years and everything was great. But now, now all of a sudden these, they didn't just come out perspective has changed and what was something you would tolerate before now you're using it to sort of rally the troops against him and there is a lot of that it's just it's opinion is it is it's part of this weird social awkwardness that we have as humans to to be right uh to Mm -hmm. to, and to make sure we have the committee with us to be right it's right you know know, and 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 if it's like we're empowered by the numbers of people seeing that it's like Mm -hmm. that's why blame you know blame helps well uh, you know, again, the, one of the brilliant moves by uh, here, clearly, this is a, a move that he did. I'm not calling him a brilliant man by any means, but 
when you know Donald Trump got in the press, he 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 blamed the Mexicans. Um, every single problem was the Mexicans' fault, and it's like you know, you know, he, he's right, and it, it, it's, it got attention. So the Mexicans did all this, and and you know, it, it's just like what well, they they did. I mean, but it's so many people, and then and then his campaign became one of blaming everybody, and then but I'm the only one that has your back, so come on with me, and. It, it it was one of the more it's one of the, the non traditional, really super effective campaigns that I've ever seen happen. It's just oh, yeah. because he 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 led into the blame. He used blame as a tool. He he then he, he he psychologically sort of modified it by not just blaming but doubling down on the blame over and over and over and over again. And it just it, it it's like we as humans secretly don't want that. We say we don't want it, but deep down we crave that blame yeah it's true in fact uh he I, i've mentioned this about trump before uh it's one of the more fascinating things about uh his personality his psychology uh from my perspective it's that um now trump ha- trump has no problem you know crossing borders <laughs> and i don't mean the, the borders to mexico i mean like boundaries uh he, he doesn't yeah. have any trouble doing that and he also has a tendency to get in trouble because of that but he has an amazing faculty for deflecting and the way he yeah. does it is really instructive he will identify when he's about to be accused of something it could be illegal it could just be immoral it could be undesirable it could be something that just his opponents don't like it doesn't make any difference but he's going to be blamed for something he gets wind of it and he blames his opponent for the exact same thing now yeah. the really interesting part is nine times out of ten the, the opponent actually never did the thing right but the action of blaming him for it or her blaming the opponent for it sets it up so that when he starts getting blamed, he can point to his opponent and say, yeah, but what about my opponent? And the really odd part about it is, like I said, it doesn't really matter whether the opponent actually did it. The fact that he set it up in advance creates this, this aura that, well, if they can do it, I can do it, which sure. it, it's a red herring. It actually never really existed except that he created, it. <laughs> but it, it's, it's a phenomenal use of, of the tool. Now, is it one that I advocate? Absolutely not. I think you're, you're crazy if you follow that, that particular route, but I have to give him credit. Man, he uses yeah. that one to perfection. Yeah. And, and, and using the, you know, the, the, the blaming and, and grouping people together and just saying all this and, you know, and then it becomes, you know, you, you get people that really, well, he's right. I mean, everything that is wrong with our country today is clearly the Mexicans fault. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, and it, it's, yeah. you're, going wait what i mean how did they give us a 30 trillion dollar death i don't know i mean it made no sense but uh you know but yet at, at the end of the day he was really good at that and it, it, mm. it's because society you know like, just like we like negative news we also are we it's very important to assign blame if you even in civil cases uh where you're suing somebody for money um there's percentages of blame so the jury will decide Okay, Walt, you're you're fifty one point six percent of blame in this case, and mm. Joel, you're the you're the remainder. It's like, wow. I mean, we we even have percentages of blame, and it's just randomly yeah. based on stuff. But it's just again, yeah. it it's just embedded in what we do. And blame tends mm-hmm. to uh, it it it's almost relieving in some way. Well, this happened, so here we go. You know, and it, it mm-hmm. it's. Not my fault because clearly this is this person's fault. And it's like, okay, but it's much more than that. But blame is a way getting stuck in blame, uh, from a psychological standpoint is so damaging. And kids that, that grow up in blame based households, you know, that they, they are never able to accept responsibility. They are never able to, you know, my, my oldest son, TJ, uh, he was, he never, really never lied too much. He was exceptionally blunt. I mean, he would just say stuff. It's like, wow, mm-hmm. bro, you probably should have lied to me about that. I mean, you know, I, he just, <laughs> he would say, then my son Chris came along and Chris wasn't capable of telling the truth. Everything was, you know, he, he could, he could eat the last cupcake in front of you going, I didn't eat that. I mean, he, mm-hmm. you know, he could do that. And then Justin came along and Justin figured out something pretty quickly, um, Justin realized, I asked 
asked him, did he do something? You know, his initial reaction might have been to lie, but he realized if you just accept responsibility, minimum to no consequences. <laughs> you know, uh-huh. the, 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 the lying about it's going to, you know, so he was really good about, yep, I did that. And then it's just like, okay, well, that's great, son. It, you know, don't do that again. It's usually my response. Let's don't do mm-hmm. that again. Um, you know, and he learned that. So even to this day, he's, he's really honest with me because he understands in our household, it, it is, I honor truth. I honor self-responsibility. I honor honesty. And mm-hmm. he, he sort of, ha- he's hacked my parenting skills. He understands. That's very cool. Yeah. That really is. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there, there are lots of different ways to get to the, the, the desired end game. He got, he found a really easy way to get there. Yeah. It's like, cause I, I'm thrown off guard. Like, did you do this? Yes, I did. Sorry. Oh, well. <laughs> so much for that. So little quick. Yeah, what am I okay. going to do now? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, let's don't do that again. Okay. And he usually yeah. doesn't do it again. It's just like, well, I'm, I'm running out of, you know, it isn't this big thing, you know, and it, it but, but it also, I, and I've always told them, the, the being honest is that I honor that more than anything. So if there is a consequence, most likely, I mean, you know, it's going to be so much less than the, the denying and all the stuff, you know, and, and also told, I told them all three. If I ask the question, it's almost 99% sure I already know the answer. There's an interesting parallel to this as I'm thinking about it. And it's not a, a connection I made before, but for some reason it's coming into my head at this point, that's actually not all that different from the way the legal system works. Yeah. If, if a person is accused of a crime and they just plead guilty and say, yeah, I did it. It's almost a certainty. They're going to get a low, a lesser sentence, almost a certainty. But if they d- declare not guilty, go to trial and then get found guilty, they're going to get a, a hit with a harsher sentence. And, yes. and I think it's actually, I think I'm pretty sure the law is actually deliberately structured that way. Which is yeah. quite interesting, right? The um, when I was charged with when I stole money from the company I worked with when I was in the middle of my gambling addiction, and I was charged with felony theft. Um, I was arrested, and I went before the judge. And you can plead guilty or not guilty at a public defender. The standard procedure is to plead not guilty and then work out a plea deal. And then mm-hmm. plead guilty. That's that's what they normally do. So when I was arrested, I was so exhausted from everything. Um, I I go into that session. And I, again, I got a public defender there. I never met him before that day. And um, so he leans over and he says, "Just say not guilty." And I looked at him and I go, and I didn't say anything to him. So the lady said, uh, "The judge, uh, you know, said, Mr. Elston, you've been charged with felony theft." Uh, do you understand the charges? Say, yes, ma'am. So how do you plead? I, said, I, plead, I plead guilty, Your Honor. There was silence. My attorney's like, uh, can I have a moment with my client? And, <laughs> and, and I'm like, I, Your Honor, I don't need a moment with, with him. I said, I'm guilty of the charges. And um, she was taken back. She said, Mr. Elson, you don't have a plea deal in place. Or I'm, I'm going to really encourage you to reconsider your plea and make sure your rights are protected. And I, I'm going... I, I I have lived with this gambling addiction for so long. I've I've, I've ran from it. Uh, everything I'm accused of, I did. I'm the one that confessed to my employer. I don't want to take another moment. And I said, and she said, "Do you realize I could put you in jail for five years?" I said, "Yes, ma'am, I do." And um, she's like, "Wow, uh, I've never had this happen." So she <laughs> she basically said, "I'm going to give you 30 days." And I'm going to put you on probation for three years and you're going to pay this back. And if you don't pay it back, you're going to come back before me, but I think you'll get it paid back. You seem like a man of integrity. And that was the, that was, that was it. And I got 30 days, which I can't imagine have gotten any better. Uh, but I, I wasn't doing it for that. I was just sick of running. I just, let me own this. I've, I ran my whole life at that point. Let me just own it and see what happens. How interesting too, her comment that you seemed to, a man of integrity. Yeah, after a plea guilty. Which was, which was, which was probably about the last thing that you were feeling. Yes, yes, it was. Not my best day, by the way, Walt. Not my best day. No, I'm sure. Yeah. 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 But, that, but I, I, I mean, there's a piece of me that, that just thinks that must have gone down well hearing that from her. 
It 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 was and it was not my intent to manipulate, but it no, it, it's certainly something that was very helpful because she was. Uh, and my attorney goes, man, I have never. He said, he said that's never do that again. Um, <laughs> he said he said that he said it worked out great for you, but she must have. You know, she said she did appreciate the the honesty. And well, I, I said again, I wasn't doing it for any other reason. I'm guilty. I, I am 100 percent guilty. There's no, yeah. there, and I said there's nobody else to blame. Um, he wanted to talk about my gambling addiction. I go that, that, no, that's not a thing for this. I did it. I still did it. I'm a sound mind. I stole the money. It's my problem. Wow. <laughs> yeah. That's really yeah yeah. It was weird. Very weird. Uh, so, well, but uh, it, 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 but, it's weird, but but it's also that, that I can't help but notice the health that was in there. Health was coming through, and it was, and you got it reflected back to you. Yeah. You didn't intend to. It was certainly not your mindset to try to, like you said, manipulate or anything like that. It, it was just, you know, pure honesty. Was, blunt honesty was coming out, and yet in that blunt honesty, you were getting something that you really needed. Yeah, yeah, it really was. It, I, I, that was, uh, and I, as you've heard me talk, that was a turning point in my life. That right. that event, you know, being charged and being and, and pleading guilty, uh, it was that day forward where you know I made. I, I, it's time to. It's I'm going to live life like I should be living life, and uh, so all of that led to it. And it, 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 again, it's one of those weird things that happened. But I, I, I don't want to go stand in front of a judge again charged with a crime. But I'm no. glad it happened. I really am glad it happened. Well, it it leads me to another thought, which is we were talking earlier about how someone who is seeking to blame is looking for a way to gain validation. You know, like you said, get 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 their team on their side. Right. And, and and as you were describing that earlier, I thought it was spot on, first of all, but it also occurred to me it's a rather thin level of nutrients. I mean, yeah, you can get somebody on your side, but it feels a little better. It doesn't really fix anything. It doesn't really feel a whole lot better, but you do get a little bit of validation out of it. Right. And it occurs to me also, well, if that's what we're looking for is a validation, what happens if we get a real validation? That's what you got in that courtroom with that judge. You got a real validation. Yeah. Yeah. And it was out of the blue, which probably was the best kind. Yeah. Now, to be fair, when all that was going on, Walt, I was in my mindset. That it, it took me a while to review all that and find value in it. Uh, I'm sure. Yeah, you're standing there and you just pled guilty to a felony. Um, you know, that's again not your best moment. And but as I reflected and looked at what she said, I was like, you know, you know that that was her. That was about as good as a compliment she can give somebody who just pled guilty to a a felony in her courtroom for stealing of all things. Yeah. 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 It, I, I think the reason I'm I'm tying these together is I'm wondering if that becomes a way out for somebody who's in a blame cycle. I wonder if there's the possibility that someone who's in a blame cycle can understand that if they're willing to take a step outside the blame cycle, they can actually get the validation they're looking for in a much bigger way than they could through the blame cycle. And that that's the concept of radical acceptance, you know, a radical, you know, just just radical responsibility, self responsibility. Uh, that's that's. I didn't mean to practice that that day, but you know, there there were mitigating factors. There are other things going on, but at the end of the day, I am solely responsible. I am the one that's at fault here. I want to stand up and take this. And you know, at that point, I had nothing going in life. At that point, anyway, I was you know, had nowhere to you know, living in a halfway house with no money and no job. So, you know, going to jail. Wasn't super scary compared to not going, not having much else. So, mm. uh, uh, you know, but it, it's at the same time, it was, I, I believe, you know, just that, that taking responsibility, radical responsibility, radical acceptance of whatever life's bringing you, I think is the way out of blame thinking. It's, it, to me, it's the solution. You know, when you, mm-hmm. you, you can spend all this energy with, yes, here's going on, this is going on. And then they, I did this or I did that. Regardless of why, I'd, I can make a case. I have a lot of addiction in my family. Uh, I have a lot of mental illness. I grew up in a very traumatic childhood. I started gambling out of response to all that, tra- you know, blah, blah, blah. And that's all true. All that's very true. 
So I can stand sure. in front of the court and say, Your Honor, I've, you know, I became a convulsive gambler because of the dysfunction. I could tell the stories and, and it, you say, well, you know, that, that's what a horrible thing to go through. But at the end of the day, I still stole the money and it, one doesn't offset the other to me. And the, the, the trying to spread blame around from all that when I am the one that made the choice, I was, it, as, even though I was in a terrible mindset, I was never lacking awareness of what I was doing. I was not actually thinking I was stealing. I was planning on putting it back when I wanted the money. But, you know, that, that's, that's, you know, clearly not going to happen. That never happened. So it's clearly not going to happen now. Um, but yet just owning that and also what it instilled in me since then is I value great forward honesty now. I, I, I put great value in just honesty. It, it, it led me to a place of, I, I just tell the truth. I, I don't, it, it's so much better to tell the truth. It's just, uh, I, I don't need to quantify or say, well, I promise or this. Back in the day when I was in the middle of my addiction, lying all the time to get money and stuff, I swear to God, I'll put my hand on the Bible. I'll say anything to get the money. My answer right now is yes or no. <laughs> that's it. That's it. And, and, and it is. And period. Will you do this? Yes. Will you not do it? I won't do it or one or the other, but no matter what, I just say what it is. For someone who is stuck in that blame cycle then, and you're proposing this idea of radical responsibility, because I, I know that's what you do with your clients for sure. And other people that you try to help. Um, sure. when you're, when you're trying to help them, first of all, come to grips with this idea of, of radical responsibility, but also take the steps to get there. What are the steps? How do, how do you get, for somebody who's actually willing to consider on some level the possibility of being willing to try to step out of blame, what are the steps for getting out? Well, the, you know, my method with anything is rapport building. I got, I got to start with building a rapport with my clients where they trust me. They, they know I have their best interests at heart because you can't go from, you know, just day one getting on this concept. Then I need to allow them to tell me their blaming story. I need, I still have to allow that to take place in the process. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and then here, you know, well, I'm this way today because my mom mismanaged my medication when I was younger, even though the doctor prescribed that. Uh, so I ha- you know, have a, a young man who's addicted to Adderall and he's 28 and every month he goes and gets his Adderall filled. Uh, while complaining to be addicted to it and blaming his mom because she put it on him when he was 12, but he picks it up every, every month himself now and takes it and complains about being addicted to it. Hmm. And, and, and I said, and he goes, but it's my mom's fault. She started it. And your mom listened to the doctor when you were 12, did what the doctor said that did start it but you're 27 years old and you're picking it up voluntarily every month, the ability to blame your mom, that expiration is the time of expiration is over. You're choosing it now. And I, I, I you have to walk them through the process of un- uncoupling the blame. The blame gives them the origins. As I said earlier, the, then you try to uncouple that and say, but here we are today. And it's, it's, it's a, it's a hard leap sometimes. Yeah, but it's a necessary one Yeah, because like you pointed out, the first time it was somebody else, all the other times it was you, which by the way is a hard thing to face. Yeah, yeah, it's just, it is. I mean, we, we you know, it, it's no matter what you try to, it, this is my fault or this isn't my fault or you know, you know, p- people will, will do things. People can victimize you. People can do all kinds of things. But when your response keep, you know, keeps being the same thing, it's a really hard break. So being able to say, I, I created this situation. My mindset was formed in addiction and mental health issues and all the other stuff. And that led to my, it's nice to know all of that. It's not nice to know. I, I know what I need to fix is, uh, I need to deal since what, what, here's an answer going back to one of your questions. What does blame do for in my case, when I say blaming, blaming led for me to discover, which then I said, okay, the origins of my family's problem is addiction and mental illness. Let's start with that. So I can't, I'm not holding that onto my problem, but I am going to no longer uh, 
be addicted. I'm going to I'm going to recover from my addiction. I'm going to stop my anxiety. I'm going to arrest my anxiety, and I'm going to defeat my depression. So I, the, identifying the origins allowed me to defeat the underpinnings of the dysfunctional relationship that that my family had developed with all of those things. You you often see posted on Facebook, and I post this often myself. Uh, you know the these generational uh, cycles of of dysfunction need to stop somewhere and they're going to stop with me so mm-hmm. identifying that i was brought up in all of that silliness and and i can get angry about it if i would allow myself to talk about you know i'm baffled that i i, I would I, I, you know, i'm sitting in the kitchen watching these things take place over and over again and nobody realizing there's a six-year-old here guys i mean you know, you're not, <laughs> yeah can, can we not threaten to kill each other or hold a gun to anybody's head tonight just maybe um but it is it is I, there's no child of mine or any child that I could even remotely affect that would ever be exposed to that because I would never allow it. And if I were to find it, I would break it. I would stop it. So mm-hmm. again, I look to that and while not optimal for me, all I can do with it is acknowledge that happened and then fix the underlying, you know, with the depression, anxiety and all the other stuff that I went through and then help others as i do in my career all the time to help others see that and not allow that to happen you know right now to my kids to right. say my kids my clients and people i work with uh, sure. we're going to break that you know one of my clients is about it when to call and say my grandfather's beating my grandmother up in the living room joel what do i do i mean if i get that call i'm like the police are there in three minutes and i'm coming too so <laughs> pray the police get there before i do yeah, right. <laughs> so, yeah, but, you know, it, it, we would break that cycle. And, I, and, I've, and I've had that. I've had a similar thing happen to my client telling me, you know, my, my dad, his dad is a drunk and he's a very high functioning drunk. Nobody knows he's a drunk in town, but he goes on a rage every night and the kid's 14 and, you know, the, 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 having to put up with that every single night. And his mom said, you can't tell anybody your dad could lose his job. And, and, and so one night it was 14. He came, the guy came downstairs and said, I'm going to beat your ass if you don't do something. He goes, and I'm about to call 911. Let's see who wins. And the kid just stood up to him, said, mm. we're not spending another house in another night in the house with a drunk. I'm calling 911 or you're getting your stuff and getting out and you and mom work this out. And the kid stood up to the little kid to stood up to his dad and, and held the phone in his hand and, and won. And, and wow. the, pat, the dad went to the treatment the next day. He went straight wow. from denial to treatment, and, and 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 you know this kid just stood right up to him and and said, "Hey, this ends tonight," and literally told him those words, and it did. It ended that night. Wow, that's impressive. Whoa, yeah. yeah. Well, he knew what that phone call would do, and he said, "All I got to do is dial nine one one, let it ring once, and they're coming." Oh yeah, so, yeah. When once the connection gets you, made, you, yeah. you don't. Yeah, and and when you're you're when you're. CEO of a massive corporation in our, in our town. Um, you don't want the police showing up at your house without that. And, right. And he knew right. that the kid was smart enough to know that. And he, he literally forced his dad into recovery. Good story is that's been a few years ago and dad's still in recovery. The kid's doing, the family's doing great. That's fabulous. Wow. Yeah. What a great way to wind up the show today. Cause I mean, it, it, this is a tough topic. And, it and is. so I was glad that we were able to find a way to, to wind it up on a high note. Uh, cause it's a topic that we all deal with one way or another. A lot of people deal with it on a day to day basis. Um, I'm, I feel pretty good about myself and that I have managed to get to the point in my own life where I don't do a lot of blaming anymore. I do a little bit, but not a whole lot. And I, I'm aiming to eliminate it as much as I can because I know how toxic it is and it's toxic it on me. That, that's the worst part. You blame somebody. You're the one who suffers for it. That's you the, blame somebody part. else and you yeah. suffer for it. The, the best thing, you know, the, 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 the most important thing you can do for yourself is, I, and, and I know, again, this message doesn't hit well sometimes in 2023, but when you accept it is your responsibility for your mental health, for your safety, for your, all that, everything, it's your responsibility. There's resources to assist you, but it's your responsibility to do that. You, you, there, there's no need for blame. I'm responsible for fixing mm-hmm. me. And it is one of the most empowering things you can do to yourself for yourself. Yeah. 
is empower yourself with the, 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 no longer the need to blame. Fabulous way to end one, the one conversation. One last thing as we wrap up. Yeah. Yeah. One, one last thing we wrap up. One of the things that I literally despise about the 12 step program in addiction treatment, uh, you thought you were going to go the whole show without me being controversial. So, sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, I know you too well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So the, the, the concept when they start talking about, uh, this is, you know, this is a disease and I, I, that's not, I'm not really upset with that because that was actually done for insurance purposes. But when you allude to this is not your fault, a condition and your, your addiction is not your fault. Uh, but it's like, wait a minute. Uh, so whose fault is it? Who's going to be fixing this? It's like, you know, a lot of times it, when, when you're like, well, I mean, if you do this, these steps, then maybe God will be fortunate enough to smile upon you and it'll be okay. Uh, but it doesn't work for everyone or be it, but nonetheless, you, you, you're going to be dependent on these meetings forever and ever, or you'll relapse. It gets mm-hmm. into a, a situation of you're, you're, it's about, well, I, I, you're, you're broken and you can't be fixed versus yet yeah, you do have something going on. It, it don't, and if you want to call it a disease, you call it a disease, but it's sort of, it's, it's sort of like type two diabetes. It's, it's a disease, sort of, but it's a lifestyle disease. Go fix it. Mm, yeah. It's fixable. Right, right. Well, nice to know that we can actually fix things in life and that it really actually can yes. turn into something that's positive. So once again, Absolutely. thank you. This, this is another topic that came right off of your Facebook page. So once again, thank you for a great topic. Um, and well, for some great, great, great show. Love having it. So, yes. And thank you to our podcast listeners everywhere. We'll see you all next time here on LOA Today. Goodbye, everybody.